Okay, so welcome to this lecture on this introduction in banking. As I've already told you, the slides for this lecture today will be in German. Next week, they'll be in English. Um, just to give you a short introduction to this whole module and this whole lecture. Um, after having talked a little bit about the uh, organization of the module and the administrative things, I will talk about and give you a short introduction of the characteristics of the German banking system and what is banking. Um, as you know, and as you've probably seen, banks are special. Financial institutions, insurance companies, but especially banks, are different from regular industrial firms for a number of reasons. And um, it's not simply the reason that banks deal in money. Um, there are a number of reasons that make banks special and that make it worthwhile for us to study banking um, in addition to all the other lectures we have, for example, on marketing, general management, logistics, etc. Um, that is why we start by some basic theories um, why banks exist. Because, um, for example, if we take, uh, I usually take, uh, okay, yeah, we have a, a pharmacy and uh, um, we have a shoe company and a shoe store. I usually take these uh, stores as an example. Um, if you take a shoe shop, it's quite ev um, evident and quite clear why we have such a company and why it exists in the market, because we need companies to produce shoes. But why do we need banks? For example, if I want to finance a project, I could simply ask you for the money directly. I could have the idea of starting a company. Uh, maybe I need 100,000 euros and I could start running around asking you for money, asking you for capital and for equity. And if you, as investors, give me some portion of your money and I get my project finance, I do not need a bank. Why do I need a bank? So this is why we start by talking about theories, why banks exist and what the functions of banks are, what banks can do better than, um, say, for example, me running around asking every one of you for money. Hmm? Actually, quite an interesting idea. Then. If we talk about banks, we need to talk a little bit about central banks. Central banks are different from private banks, and this is obviously a business administration class. This is a management class on banking and corporate banking. But to understand corporate banking, we need to know what central banks are for, what they do, and how they interact with corporate banks. So we talk about central banking. Then we next move to uh, the different business models of banks. We have corporate banking, we have commercial banking, we have investment banks. Investment banking is totally different from corporate banking. And I will tell you how banks can earn money, what they do, um, what business models they have, and how they can generate profits, ideally. Because as you might know, uh, most of the banks, at least in, uh, in the European Union, are currently working quite hard on earning a buck. And they're having problems earning um, profits from their <laughs> traditional business models. Just lending, giving out money, and taking in deposits doesn't work so well in a time where we have almost zero interest rates. Then banks have an important function as risk managers. And as uh, banks usually have quite an elaborate risk management um, in um, their companies, we'll talk a little bit about risk management. So what types of risk are there? Uh, banks face several risks, obviously credit risk. If I, as a bank, give a credit and give a loan to you and you default, obviously I have a credit risk. I have the risk that you might default on my loan and I will lose money. So credit risk, market risk, interest rate risk, uh, operational risk. These are the risk types we'll be talking about. And later on, also a little bit about bank regulation. Um, I've left a one important part here. I think it's um, in also bank regulation and four. It's um, accounting. Um, you you probably have taken the basic accounting classes already uh, with Professor Schmidt. Okay, but uh, who's who's not aware of the basic accounting rules in his or her respective home country? <coughs> an idea what a balance sheet looks like, what uh, an income statement is. OK. So usually, we talk about basic accounting for all types of industrial companies, for shoe manufacturers, 
for um, retail companies. And usually these balance sheets and these income statements all look alike. With one exception, as soon as you talk about insurance companies or banks, the balance sheet and the income statement will look totally different because of their totally different business model. So the accounting rules have to be different as well. And we'll be talking about the basic German accounting rules for banks here in Germany and some rules under IFRS, uh, the International Financial Reporting Standards, just so that you know how to read the balance sheet of a bank. And finally, um, banks are also special in the respect that they are regulated. They are supervised and regulated heavily by the state, by each state. And we'll first learn the reasons why banks are regulated and why they are supervised. For example, there's no regulation or supervision of the shoe store um, across the street. If they want to sell shoes, uh, sell shoes, they can do so. And we will not stop them. But you cannot simply put up a sign and say, I am uh, Fritz Meyer Bank now, and I'm um, lending out loans. I'm lending uh, money. This is not possible because the state regulates the access to the market in banking. And there are several good reasons why the state is interested in doing so. And we'll learn about these reasons and uh, the special provisions um, that, are, um, that have been put in place by the state to regulate and supervise banks. And finally, we'll talk about uh, the specific um, characteristics of selected um, foreign bank systems, and most notably the US and Japan, because those are the most important banking sectors in the world, the US sector, the European Union. Obviously, we'll be talking about the European Union here most of the time, and also Japan, because Japan is quite interesting um, for several reasons. First of all, uh, they have been going through the same set of uh, low interest rate uh, environment um, that we are going through right now, but they are experiencing this, or they have been experiencing this for the last 25 years. So most of the problems our banks now have, Japanese banks had them uh, way back in the 90s. And there are also some other things that are special about Japanese banks. For example, you might know the system of Kiretsu. Uh, does anyone know what Kiretsu means? OK, no exchange students from Japan. In Japan, it is quite common, and it used to be very common, that um, you have large conglomerates of companies <coughs> built around, uh, around one bank. For example, you have Mits take Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi is a large conglomerate built around, nowadays, the UF, I think, UFJ Mitsubishi Bank. So it used to be a large bank. And around this bank, in this large um, conglomerate, you have, for example, a car manufacturer, Mitsubishi, and other companies. Mitsubishi also produces air conditioning systems. And this is something we usually do not know here in the European, in, in Europe, that these companies in Japan actually are large conglomerates, including a bank, um, an insurance company, a car manufacturer, uh, a construction company. For example, the largest, actually the largest Japanese bank uh, originates from a construction company, Sumitomo Bank. So this is, these are just a few reasons why the Japanese banking system is also very special. OK, so this is the outline of the lecture. And I will just give you some basic uh, information on the module itself. We have three hours per week, two hours lecture here, and one hour uh, it's called an E-Veranstaltung in German. It's, a, it's a, an electronic uh, exercise and tutorial. Uh, these are simply some videos I recorded once and I put up on YouTube um, in which I give you some example um, exam uh, questions. Uh, I talk a little bit about uh, how these questions could look like in an exam. And uh, this is done, as I've said, in tutorial videos on YouTube. It's, it's an elective in the Bachelor in Economics and Business Administration. But of course, if you are in some other um, bachelor degree, you can also take this class. It gives you five ECTS uh, credit points, and the exam will be a 60-minute uh, written exam at the end, which can be taken either in German or in English. Okay. Now, um, let me just ask you, who is taking this class as an exchange student? Probably, yeah. 
you can, you can either uh, write the exam or you can write an Erasmus paper. Uh, this is the uh, idea that uh, you simply write a term paper. Um, you can come to me after a couple of uh, weeks and uh, we can uh, find a suitable topic on which you can write a term paper. So I would suggest that you uh, attend the lecture, um, get an idea of uh, what obviously the introduction is banking, uh, to banking is about, and then we can come up with a, a suitable topic for a term paper. If you do not want to write a term paper, you can always take the exam at the end of the class. So either way, you can earn the five credit points. Okay. So um, if you haven't already found my website, you can go um, to yes, home to this uh, very no okay not so easy. Um, you can actually go to www.gregorweiss. Dot com, quite easy, and if you go to this website, you get this lovely picture of me, and you go to teaching, you should see the other pictures of me uh, floating around in the internet. I do believe this is one of the better pictures. <laughs> and you simply go to teaching, and if you go to teaching, you can see here courses, winter semester, introduction to banking. So. Here you will find uh, the links to the slides. The whole set of German slides is already uploaded. Um, you can see that I've uploaded three um, previous exams from previous semesters, so you can get a very good idea of how the exam will look like. And one important information, the password for all material is always Sector pound seven G. A large S, large G at the end, and with a K. And if you ever forget what how I came up with this password, it's the um, workplace of Homer Simpson in the nuclear power plant at Springfield. Sector seven G. Okay, so if you just open this, you can see um, the link will take you to our university cloud, and there you can type in the password, and then you can download the file. Okay, now, this is the website for the course, and you can write me emails, advice at vifa.uni-leipzig.de um, and if you wonder where these uh, taped and recorded uh, videos will be put up uh, you simply go to the next page um, you see this large YouTube button and if you click on the YouTube button uh, it will take you to the playlist uh, more precisely it will take you to the channel on YouTube and uh, starting with this semester I will be uploading all videos um, as listed videos. So um, if you go to the channel, you might also find the playlist for the recordings in German from last year. But this year, I will be uh, uploading the videos as listed videos. So you can also try to search for them on YouTube. This is something different. So last year, the videos from last year are non-public. So the easiest way for you to uh, stay tuned is just to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And every time I upload a new video, you will be notified that there's a new video. Okay. Next, um, it's actually quite difficult for me to write an email to all of you. Uh, that is why, uh, the, the reason is why, for this is why, um, no, is that um, you're all coming from different uh, programs business and economics, Erasmus uh, exchange students, etc. So I do not have a comprehensive list of all of your email addresses. So for me, the easiest way to get in touch with every one of you is if you just subscribe to this ma uh, mailing list at Banken. Uh, this is the mailing list for all the elective modules um, here in banking and risk management. Um, and every time I have, for example, a guest lecture, uh, some other information I want to send around, I use this mailing list. So please subscribe to this mailing list. And in addition to that, 
I usually get a lot of spam in terms of job offers, uh, offers for internships from, crum uh, from companies, etc. So if you are interested in receiving these job offers, uh, you can subscribe to the second uh, mailing list, uh, Jobs Bank Fin. So every time I get any new uh, offer, I will just uh, forward it to these mailing lists. Okay. Now, if you you do not have to buy a book. You don't have to buy um, or to, to use any any textbook. But if you want, uh, you can use, you can take this one, Bankbetriebslehre by Hartmann, Wendels, Pfingsten, Weber. This is a very uh, the most standard textbook on banking in German. It's uh, the market leader, um, and some parts of the lecture are based on on this textbook. Um, The next one by Eilenberger, Bankbetriebs, Wirtschaftslehre, Grundlagen, internationale Bankleistungen, Bankmanagement. This is also okay, but it's, it's not as theoretical as Bankbetriebslehre, as the first one. Um, there's also uh, this one uh, by uh, some colleagues of mine and uh, myself, Unternehmerische Finanzierungspolitik. This is actually a more general textbook aimed at all finance investment topics uh, in the bachelor's degree. It also has um, a part on risk management. And the part of this lecture on risk management is based completely on this section in the textbook. But I've donated, I think, 10 uh, copies of our textbook to our library, so you do not need, you can buy it, of course. I'm earning one euro per uh, copy, um, but, uh, We should have enough uh, copies in the library. Okay. I haven't included all the English textbooks. Uh, there is a, uh, an abundance of English textbooks on banking, investment banking, corporate banking, commercial banking, introduction to banking, etc. You do not need those textbooks. You can have a look at these textbooks, but you will find that most textbooks in English are actually uh, a, little bit, a little bit too simple. Um, they are aimed at, um, at students at U.S. universities, and usually um, they, um, they do not uh, study the theoretical background of banking. Uh, they just have a, a basic introduction to how banks work, what uh, um, business they offer, and that's it. Okay. So if you want any idea on these textbooks, just get in touch with me. Okay. I've already talked about uh, the, the aims of the lecture. I want to give you um, um, basic knowledge and basic understanding of what banks are, what makes banks so special, and how banking sectors work. So do you have any questions concerning the module itself, the videos, the slides, etc.? By the way, if you have any problems with me, uh, Uh, with my English or any question what I mean with a certain vocabulary, just ask me. Uh, and I can try to translate it back to German. Yes? Um, do you have to take the e-learning? No. 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 Uh, you, do not, you do not need to um, take the tutorial. Uh, it's only intended to help you with the exam. And you do not have to, to listen and to watch the videos. The videos are just the exact same recordings of this lecture here. But in case you, for example, have another module you want to attend at this very moment, or if you um, want uh, to watch the videos in preparation of the exam, you can do so. So um, there will be exactly the same amount of information in the videos as here in the lecture hall. So not more. and. Uh, No, no more, no less. Further questions? Okay, so let's start. Um, yeah? For example, when will this lecture be put on YouTube? Uh, we'll usually cool. take one week, two at the most, I think. So it usually takes a time for me to produce the videos. So the, the computer, because these are extremely large files. That is also important. I have to give one disclaimer. 
I cannot guarantee that all lectures will be recorded. These files are sometimes three to four gigabytes large. And it very uh, randomly and seldomly happens that these files are cropped. And in that case, I cannot uh, salvage the recording. So every semester, um, across, uh, in the cross-section of all my lectures, I usually have one recording that is um, not functional and that is corrupt. In, in that case, I cannot, uh, as I said, I cannot salvage the recording. I do not have any means of uh, fixing the technical problem then. But uh, usually all the recordings should be uploaded within a week. Okay. Okay, so let's start with a basic definition of what a bank is. How would you define a bank? In the most simplest way, we could simply say, OK, a bank is a company that offers banking services. It's trivial. You know, a bank is a bank. OK. Um, usually, banks engage with other companies in financial markets. So it's useful to start with a basic definition of what is a financial market. Here you can see a financial market is a market in which financial contracts are traded. We try to use a definition that is as um, abstract as possible and as general as possible. And this is why we talk about financial contracts. We do not talk about securities. We do not talk about loans. We talk about financial contracts. And financial contracts can be anything. It can be a loan. It can be a security, bad papier. It can be any uh, interchange of financial um, payments between two parties and this is what we first say. We have a financial market and the financial market is a market in which we trade financial contracts. So these are contracts in which we exchange current or future payments. So if you have already heard um, the lectures on derivatives uh, by Professor Schumacher, you might know that of course you can you um, can exchange current payments. So I'll give you 500 euros and you'll give me a security, but you can also exchange future payments. So I will give you 500 euros in one year, and in one year you will give um, one ton of steel, and you will deliver one ton of steel to me. So these um, are the two basic types of um, contracts, of financial contracts. And we have financial markets. Put even simpler, in a financial market, um, two parties and two types of party meet. We have investors, here, Kapitalgeber, and companies that are in need of capital, that require financing uh, to finance a project to invest this money. So banks and financial markets actually have similar functions. They all somehow enable parties to meet and to exchange financial contracts and to exchange financial payments. So what's the difference between a financial market and a bank? We'll see that later on. So one distinction between a financial market, like for example a stock exchange, and a bank is that a bank can also itself on its own account engage in this market. If you take, for example, a stock exchange, a stock exchange will only enable two other parties to engage in a contract. The stock exchange will never trade a stock by itself, but it will only um, make it feasible and enable parties to enter this contract. It will never enter this market itself. A bank is different. A bank might function and might uh, act as an enabler, but it will also engage itself in this market, for example, by buying securities, by engaging uh, as a lender itself. And so a bank is something different from a financial market. And this makes it uh, necessary to come up with a different definition, first in a different type of uh, market agent. And we usually talk of financial intermediaries. Um, into financial intermediaries in a very strict sense, in a, in a broader sense. Now, a financial intermediary in a strict sense is just an institution that takes up capital from market agents, 
and gives this capital away to other market agents. So it simply functions as um, an institution that um, uh, accumulates capital and then gives out this capital to other investors in a different form. A financial intermediary in a broader sense um, also enables um, the, the trading of financial contracts. So if you take, for example, a security, that papier, as a financial contract, you obviously can trade this security. And a financial intermediary, in a broader sense, enables the trading of this security. Okay. Now here, you can see um, a schematic of how financial intermediaries work and what their functions are. Usually, um, we could think about an investor giving capital to someone who needs financing. And this is the situation I outlined at the very start of the lecture. I might be interested in forming my own country, uh, my own company. I need 100,000 euros. And I start running around asking each and every one of you, can you lend me 1,000 euros? And if I find 100 persons who lend me 1,000 euros, I have financed my project. And this is not a very efficient way of doing it. So the first thing a bank will do is it takes up the capital from the investors. It will tr somehow transform this capital. And then it will be able to finance the projects of other companies. And here you can already see how this works on the balance sheets of the companies and the bank. Take, for example, the investor on the left-hand side. The investor, say, for example, this is uh, this is an investment uh, fund. The investment fund has uh, some uh, real assets. It might have uh, some cars. It might have a building. It might also be a, a manufacturing company. And it has equity on the uh, right-hand side um, of the balance sheet. Now, what happens? Um, the investor uses its money and gives the money and gives the capital to the bank. And where does the capital show up on the balance sheet of the bank? Here you can see why it's useful to have special accounting rules for banks, because the balance sheet of a bank is the other way around as compared to a usual industrial company. So what does a bank do? Take, for example, a savings and loans association, Sparkasse. What does a Sparkasse in German was, what does a savings and loan association do? It takes up deposits. It accumulates capital in the form of deposits, Depositen, Spareinlagen, um, from customers. And usually we would think, well, these are deposits, right? We are saving money, so they should go on the left-hand side. No, at the bank, it will go on the right-hand side, on the liability side of the balance sheet. And what does the bank do with the money? It uses these deposits to give out loans. And if we grant a loan, for example, to my uh, example of a shoe company here, um, the loan will, what will it be? An asset or a liability? It's a claim. I have a claim against the shoe company for the repayment of the loan. So this is an asset for me. So this explains why this is the other way around here uh, with the bank. The bank on its asset side, on its left-hand side in the balance sheet, has all the loans it has given out. And on the right-hand side, uh, the financing side, the liability side of the bank, it usually has a large proportion of deposits, of customer deposits. And this is why a balance sheet of a bank looks totally different from the one of an industrial company. And also, what do you think? Um, do you have an idea? What other differences there are for a balance sheet of a bank? One very major difference. If you take, for example, the balance sheet of Daimler as a large, very large uh, German industrial company, and Deutsche Bank as the largest German bank. One major difference in the, dif uh, in the balance sheets of these companies. Hmm? Yes, usually the bank will only hold very few real assets, maybe one building, maybe a few real estate properties, 
um, but it usually the the whole balance sheet will usually consist only of financial assets, securities, loans, customer deposits, uh, loans from other banks, loans from with the central bank. Yes, and another la major difference: the total assets, the sum of total assets, total assets, bilan summa. What would you think? What is the balance sheet of uh, Deutsche Bank look like? Way yes, than even trillion dollars and trillion euros. If you take, for example, um, a small savings and loans banks, it will have a balance sheet of, say, 50 billion euros, 50 milliarden. In terms of an industrial firm, we would say this is a huge, la very large company. As a bank, it's rather small. Deutsche Bank has a, a under, I think, uh, on the IFRS, Deutsche Bank uh, has a balance sheet and a total assets of around 1.5 trillion euros, 1,5 billion euro. So this is one major difference between industrial firms and um, banks. And the reason for this is quite obvious. Banks <laughs> deal in money. They do not deal in shoes, they do not deal in cars, they deal in money. So obviously the balance sheet will be blown up by the fact that uh, they just um, accumulate money and capital and give it out again. Okay. So this is what inter financial intermediaries do. By the way, if you are interested in this in more detail and in more theoretical detail, um, my colleague, Professor Vollmer, has uh, lectures on financial intermediation from a, an economic viewpoint. So uh, this is also done in economics. OK. Now, the second easiest way of coming up with a definition of what a bank is, is, is it's in Germany, is to look up the basic banking act that exists in the German legal code on banking. Um, the basic uh, and the, uh, the central uh, German law governing banks is the KWG, the KWG, the Gesetz über das Kreditwesen. In every country you will find one of these laws that is central in governing and ruling over banks. And in Germany this is the KWG, the Gesetz über das Kreditwesen. So this law um, includes all uh, the relevant uh, provisions um, on the regulation and supervision of banks in Germany. And in paragraph one, uh, section one, and the first sentence, so at the very start of this uh, law, um, you can see, you can find a, defin a legal definition of what uh, credit institutions are in Germany. So they say um, a credit institution, they do not talk about banks, they say it's a credit institution, Credit Institute. these are companies that are offering banking services in a fashion that requires a professional setup of shop. So if you, for example, if I say, can you lend me five euros? I do not automatically, be automatically become a credit institution because I'm not doing this professionally. But if you're doing it professionally, and if you are offering banking services, you're automatically a credit institution under this law. And suddenly all the provisions of this law affect you. Now the question is, banking services, what are banking services? Bankgeschäfte. This is um, shown in the second part of paragraph one. Um, here all the different types of banking services are enumerated. And the first one is deposit taking. Deposit taking, deposits, in German Einlagen, Spareinlagen, Termineinlagen, etc., allgemein Einlagen, deposits, and deposit taking is simply uh, taking money from people and um, just offering interest on these deposits. Yeah. Okay, and one difference, it's not securitized. Um, here in the German description you can see the deposits um, besteht kein Rückzahlungsanspruch in verbriefter Form. This is uh, quite interesting, I think, for the German students of you. Um, Verbriefung in German. Brief, as you know, letter, Verbriefung. Um, the English word for Verbriefung is securitization. And security is the English word for Wertpapier. So uh, the process of securitization simply means that you take up a claim you have 
against someone and you create a security out of it. And if you create a security, you can trade it. So for example, if I say, okay, can you lend me five euros? Okay, um, I could simply also write down a note and say, okay, I owe to the owner of this small piece of paper five euros, and I promise to pay back the five euros plus interest. So suddenly this claim you have against me becomes a security, a very basic, uh, trivial form of security, but nonetheless a security. And you can, if you have the security, you can give it away to someone else. This is the process of uh, securitization. <coughs> and deposits are different. Deposits are not securitized, at least in Germany. In the United States, some forms of deposits can be securitized and can be traded, but here in Germany, they cannot be. They cannot. Okay, then we have different and additional forms of banking services, Fundbriefgeschäft, Kreditgeschäft, Discountgeschäft, Finanzkommissionsgeschäfte. I would ask you to look these up if you do not know the English words for them. They will be in the English slides. Um, basically, these are all the types of banking services a bank can offer. Kreditgeschäft, credit business and lending. Well, this is obvious. If I give out loans, if I lend money to people and companies, I'm a bank. Fundbriefgeschäft is a very German thing. Uh, Fundbriefe, these are securities that are, um, have a, an additional um, form of, um, uh, not security, um, what's the English word? Sicherheit. Um, Um, an additional form of guarantee. Um, most notably, usually Fundbriefe are, um, um, they are um, securitized um, by having um, a claim against uh, real estates and real estate properties as an additional guarantee um, for uh, payment. So if you give out, for example, a loan if you um, give out uh, a bond um, and um, the company defaults, you as a buyer, um, you have a problem. You will not get your money back. In case of these Fundbriefe, you will have additional security that you can um, also use the real estate property to get your money back. So this is uh, a type of bond um, with um, additional guarantees. And uh, there are only a few banks in Germany um, that are heavily invested in this uh, market. And uh, most interestingly, um, the major player in this market used to be, does anyone know? HRE, Hypo Real Estate. Uh, Hypo Real Estate is a large bank uh, that um, was the major player in this market. And uh, they, um, had um, a large stake in this market. And during the financial crisis, um, they were close to bankruptcy because of their investments in Ireland. Uh, and this was one reason. And the fact that they were a major player in this market was the main reason why the German government stepped in and bailed out Hypo Real Estate, um, because they were the most important player in the market uh, for these uh, special types of bonds. Lending. Clear um, discountgeschäfte if you buy checks. Uh, this is uh, if you trade in checks. This is uh, this also makes you a bank and a credit institute. Um, if you buy financial instruments on behalf of someone else, you become a bank. And it goes on and on and on. If you um, hold securities for someone else, you're a credit institution. Um, if you have, um, if you are in the business of giving out guarantees for someone else, for example, if you um, act as a guarantor for an industrial company that, is, uh, that needs a, a guarantee, um, you're also a bank. If you are in the business of um, giving out securities, if you do securitization, this also makes you a bank under German law. And finally, if you engage in investment banking and if you engage in e-money, uh, electronic money, uh, these are the, late, uh, the latest additions to this law, uh, you're also uh, a bank under German law. And finally, 
um, if you act as a central counterparty. Now, this needs some explanation. In, if you take a stock exchange, a stock exchange uh, works like this. For example, you have Deutsche Börse, and like we too, we are traders on the floor at Deutsche Börse. I buy a security. Uh, you want to sell a security. And what happens is that Deutsche Börse, as the stock exchange, guarantees all payments. If I'm not able to deliver um, my payment, and if you are not able to deliver the stock I'm buying, the security, Deutsche Börse will reimburse uh, the party uh, who is being defrauded. Now, in an OTC market, in an over-the-counter market, there is not such a central party guaranteeing all payments. And uh, over-the-counter market works more or less like a stock exchange, but with the distinction that there is no central party like Deutsche Börse, for example, that guarantees all, payment, all payments. But in case, for example, we trade a security OTC, I would simply ask you, are you willing to sell me a stock? You would say, yes, OK, I'm willing to pay this price. And then I will give you my money. And afterwards, you will say, oh, I'm bankrupt. And um, I have a problem. So there's no one to guarantee this payment for me. This is the fundamental difference between an OTC market and a regulated market, like a stock exchange. So what do you do? Um, in the financial, during the financial crisis, uh, markets found out uh, the hard way that OTC markets can be very dangerous. Because in uh, one famous case, in the case of <laughs> um, the <coughs> Sorry. In the case of uh, the credit default swap market, um, people and companies weren't trading which, with each other, but they were actually trading um, and engaging with almost one party. And one party was the major market player in the CDS market, and this company was American International Group, AIG. AIG was more or less uh, the most dominant counterparty in a number of these uh, contracts. And what happened was that AIG had problems and several large banks had claims against AIG. And if a had I AIG defaulted, all, ma all major investment banks in the US would have suffered severe losses. So what happened was the Fed and uh, the US government stepped in, they bailed out AIG, and afterwards they realized, OK, we cannot allow um, these things to happen again in an OTC market, unregulated, intransparent. Um, and what has happened is that in many OTC markets, um, people have come up with the idea of a central counterparty. So in these markets, you nowadays have um, uh, market players as well who function like a regulated stock exchange in a slightly different way. So payments are guaranteed and this is what a central counterparty does. It guarantees um, the payments and it makes sure that all payments are done and transferred. Okay. So these are the basic banking services. More or less, it comes down to lending, deposit taking, and investment banking. We'll talk about investment banking later, but first, let's first stick to lending and deposit taking. And you will immediately see that this is what a regular German savings and loan association or um, a credit union, Volksbank, uh, does. By the way, um, so that you know the German and the English words, savings and loan associations are usually Sparkassen and or a savings bank, and credit unions are what we call in German Volks- and Raiffeisenbanken. So credit unions are unions. They are organized as a union. Now, under German law, there are some specific forms of banks. So we started with the Credit Institute, the credit institution, and in paragraph one, uh, section 3D of the Kreditwesen Gesetz is stated that if a credit institution engages in Einlagen 
or Kreditgeschäft, so in deposit taking and or lending, it immediately becomes not only a, a bank, but what we call an Einlagenkreditinstitut, so a deposit taking bank. And in several other countries, we also have this distinction between a bank in general and a deposit taking bank. Why do you think is this distinction made? Why is it important to make this further distinction between any, any bank and a deposit taking bank? Take, for example, um, an investment bank and a credit union. Why is it important to make this distinction that the credit union is also a deposit taking bank? In the most basic um, form of an investment bank. An investment bank simply takes up money and capital from large investors and invests this money in high-risk assets. You want this type of business being done at a credit union where all of us go and give our deposits to the bank. No. As soon as a bank engages in deposit taking the state has a special interest in regulating and supervising this bank in a much tougher way than it does, for example, with investment banks. Why? Because people need to be protected from higher risk taking. So if you go to a credit union and you bring your deposits to a credit union or a savings and loan association and you're earning 0.1% interest rate on these deposits, these deposits should be safe and they should not be subject to the to a default of the bank and how can we pr um, and we make sure that these banks that take in deposits do not default as easily as other banks we make a distinction and we put up tougher regulation and tougher supervision for banks that take in deposits and this is what is done in almost any legal system and here in germany we make this distinction that we have banks kreditinstitute and einlagenkreditinstitute if a bank trades in securities, this makes the bank more risky. So this is why we have the next distinction, Wertpapier and Handelsbank, a, security, a securities trading bank, a bank that engages in, for example, uh, financial commissions business and other financial services that are not lending, that are not deposit taking. And next distinction, mostly due to the fact that we now have uh, several um, companies um, like fintechs that engage solely in electronic business, we have an e guild institute. So these are credit institutions that only engage in some form of electronic banking. And with fintechs, we now have a number of these institutions that do not have uh, um, local representatives, they do not have local offices, they do not lend money, they only offer certain types of electronic financial services. Okay. Now in Germany, um, the um, definitions and the, the words bank, uh, banker, bankier, and Sparkasse, savings association, uh, they are protected by paragraphs 39 and 40 in the Kreditwesengesetz. Why is that? Because the state uh, does not want any uh, company uh, to simply call itself a bank uh, when it's not a bank. So if you want to um, form a company, if you want to build a company, you cannot simply call it a bank or a Sparkasse. Makes sense. Um, the terms and the names Volksbank, beziehungsweise and or Spar- und Darlehenskasse. So a credit union, um, and uh, uh, savings union, union, these are also protected trademarks in Germany uh, and in Germany, and they can only be used by companies that have the legal form of eingetragene uh, Genossenschaft, which is um, a registered union. Um, does, any, does everyone know what a Genossenschaft or a union, a registered union is? Who does not know what a union is? The, the, the distinctive feature of a union is. Okay, two. Who can explain what a union is?
It's a very socialist uh, idea, actually. Yes. So it's not a single company, it's a big company, but one of the no, no, it's, it's neither a syndicate nor a cartel. You've described what it basically is a cartel. Yeah, yeah. okay. I think everyone who invests has a share of the company, so you actually own part of it, which is yes. the company. Yes, in a union, the customers become the equity investors. And every shareholder has the same share in the company. You cannot buy, say, 10% in a union. So for example, all of us, we could form a union. And in that case, each and every one of us would have the same stake, the same share in the company. And usually, these unions work like this. You walk up to a local office of a Volksbank, of a credit union, and you ask them for a loan. And in that case, they will tell you, yes, but in order for you to get a loan, you have to become a member, mitglied. You have to become a member of the credit union, and that means that you have to invest, say, 20 or 30 euros. You will get uh, an account with a credit union with a share of 30 euros. And as long as you are a customer with the bank, this share will also get interest. This will earn a dividend, a small dividend, um, distributed by um, and from the earnings and profits of the credit union. And obviously, the credit union does not have shareholder uh, value maximization as its prime objective, but the prime objective of such a credit union is the offer of the service itself. These credit unions are uh, and have been formed in order to offer lending, to offer banking services. For example, to agricultural companies, to, agri to uh, farmers. So these are credit unions. Do you know one example um, in the financial industry where you have the very, a very similar concept, where you also have companies in, in this uh, legal form of a union? Perhaps you know the English word that is also used for this sort of legal entity. In English, the adjective is mutual. If you ever see a company having the adjective mutual in its title, you know it's a union. So mutual insurers are insurance companies that are organized as a union and they offer insurance contracts to their customers and the customers are the shareholders with a fixed share. And in German, this is the VVAG, Versicherungsverein auf Gegenseitigkeit. So you have insurance companies um, organized as a stock company, <coughs> as a corporation. In this case, you have, for example, Allianz SE, it's a European stock company, or I don't know, some other company, AG. That's the German word for Aktiengesellschaft, stock company. And you have to be careful because with insurance companies, you sometimes see, for example, something like this. Think Signal, Iduna, la la la. AG with a small A and not a capital A. If you have a capital A and a capital G, it's a stock company. If the A is small, um, it's, it's a union. So this is a mutual insurer. And it's the same as a Volksbank, as a credit union. Okay. Sparkasse. Um, in Germany, what's, what's the difference between a private bank, a savings and loan association, and a credit union? Now we've talked about a credit union. A credit union is a bank in which the customers are the shareholders. Now who is the owner and the shareholder of a savings and loan association, of a Sparkasse? Any idea? Yeah? It's the, the country or the, yeah, it's the country the, the Sparkasse is located in. For example, yeah. the Sparkasse like is close. Specific. Not the state, the local communities. The local. So 
usually um, savings and loan association are state owned and they are in Germany at least they are owned by the local um, communities so by the Städte by the cities and um, the districts Kreise you know? so this is why we say Kreissparkasse Stadtsparkasse etc um, let me ask you from which countries are you from is anyone from Spain uh, I think um, the 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 Cajas de Arroz, are they also state owned? The 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 uh, savings and loan associations. The, uh, doesn't Spain have the Cajas de Arroz? Yes. Are they also state owned? Yeah. No? In many, especially in Europe, in many countries, uh, you can still find um, these uh, credit unions, but also state owned local banks. In the United States, actually, not so much anymore. Um, you do find savings and loan associations, but almost all of these banks are not state-owned. And they, obviously, in the United States, the reason is that uh, something that is state-owned cannot be good. You know? So usually, this is, uh, this is something from hell uh, for, for US Americans. But in, in Europe, we do have a lot of state-owned banks. And in Germany, these are the Sparkassen. Also, Bausparkasse, Kapitalanlagegesellschaft, Investmentgesellschaft, so investment corporation um, and uh, construction uh, uh, credit union, these are also um, copyrighted trademarks, and you cannot simply uh, use those for your company. Okay. Under the Banking Act in Germany, we also have Finanzdienstleistungsinstitutions financial service institutions and finance um, companies and financing companies. The first type of companies, these are corporations and companies that offer financial services for others and in a professional manner, and uh, which are not credit institutions. And usually these are companies that, for example, advise on investment. If you only advise on investment, and if you advise other companies how to invest the money, uh, how to invest their money, this doesn't make you a bank, but under German law, this makes you a finan financial service company. Okay, and we also have financing companies. This is also um, important because um, we have uh, several companies in Germany that offer, for example, leasing contracts. Usually, if you look around here, well, actually not here, but if you go to any office, you will usually uh, type, uh, find a Xerox uh, copywriter, and these are leased. Uh, they are leased. Uh, company cars are leased. And if you offer leasing contracts, uh, this does not automatically make you a bank, but it makes you a financing company. So why do we have this distinction between banks financial service companies and financing companies. The reason is why, um, the reason is that um, the provisions of the German Banking Act, they do not all apply to these three types of banks. Usually they all apply to banks, but only a subset of these provisions apply to financial service companies, and even a smaller subset of these uh, provisions apply to financing companies. This makes sense. For example, there are a lot of provisions uh, on lending and deposit taking. And if you only offer leasing contracts, uh, these provisions shouldn't be uh, relevant for you as a, as a company. So this is why we have banks, financial service companies, and financing companies. And we also have other uh, types of uh, financial intermediaries. Um, I will only single out one type of uh, institution that is a bank assurance company. Uh, also sometimes written, written together, bank assurance. What is bank assurance? In German, it's Alfinanz. This is the combination of a bank and an insurance company. Do you know one example of such a bank assurance company? Actually one that failed in Germany. Any idea? 
any company that offers financial services in the form of banking services and insurance contracts. I think the most famous example was Allianz and Dresdner Bank. A couple of years ago, actually almost more than a decade ago, um, Allianz, uh, Germany's largest private insurance company, had the glorious idea of buying Dresdner Bank. At the time, I think the third or fourth largest bank in Germany. They had the idea of buying Dresdner. And what is the basic idea behind uh, a bank assurance company? Why do you form such a bank assurance company? Why? Because you are interested in synergies. And the most important synergy is that the bank and usually also the insurance company have a network of local offices. And for example, if you walk into a local office of your insurance company, the agent in this office can also try to sell you a loan. It can, he or she can also try to sell you a banking service. And the other way around, if you walk into a bank, the bank agent uh, will try to sell you an insurance contract. So this is the basic idea, more or less, behind a bank insurance company. They try to generate synergy effects simply due to the fact that they have a large network of local offices. This hasn't worked well in Germany, only in few ex uh, um, exceptions. For example, do you know one exception? where actually you can buy uh, insurance contracts and banking services, yes? Maybe yes. Sparkasse, yes. The savings and loan associations and also the credit unions in Germany, um, due to their very special organization, um, they have, um, there um, exists a large number of small institutions at the local level, but they are organized uh, on a national uh, level, and at the national level, uh, both the credit unions and the savings and loan associations have each one large insurance company. For the credit union, this is R&V Versicherung. And for the savings and loan association, this is the Provincial, for example. And they are offering insurance contracts and they are cross-selling these products via the local offices of the credit unions and the uh, savings and loan associations. But this is a very special construction. For example, for Dresden and Allianz, this hasn't worked out. After a couple of years of trying to merge these companies, Allianz finally said, OK, we give up. We are selling Dresden to Commerzbank. <coughs> so they, they abandoned this idea of a bank assurance company. OK. So these are some possibilities of defining a bank. You have a legal definition, a company that is offering banking services, and then you have this enumeration of the banking services. Um, you can also um, use a more general definition as a financial intermediary. And um, we'll use each of these uh, definitions as we go along in the lecture. OK, so what are the basic functions of banks? Um, you, you probably have an idea of what banks do better uh, than the situation in which I run around and ask each and every one of you uh, for a thousand euros uh, to finance my project. So banks should be able to coordinate the needs of investors and, uh, and uh, companies that are willing um, to take up a loan. So what does a bank do? Um, this is very, um, a very abstract and very basic way of looking at this, but I think this is very instructive to see what banks actually do and why we need banks. Now, a financial market acts in several ways. First, it has a coordinating function, it has an allocating function, and a selection function. Um, it transforms lot sizes, losgrößen. Uh, it transforms maturities and it transforms risk. And we'll talk about each uh, one of these points in more detail now. Now, what is the coordinating function of a financial market? Financial markets help investors um, in their search for contract partner. Now, as I've said, my uh, starting point would be I am in need of 100,000 euros. I need capital. Now, what should I do? 
I could ask each and every one of you, and you would tell me, I can give you five euros, or I can give you 500 euros, and this will be a lot of work for me. So it would be much easier if you were all to go to a financial market, in this case, the bank, the financial intermediary, and if you would give all your money, which you want to invest, to the bank, and I simply go up to the bank and ask the bank for a loan. So this is much easier than me running around. Now, the financial market and a bank also has an allocating function. Capital is a scarce good. So we have uh, too little capital for too many projects, and someone has to decide which are the projects that are worthwhile. Now, again, I could ask each and every one of you, uh, do you want to invest in my project? And then each and every one of you would have to ask him or herself, do I want to invest in this shady business? This is not very efficient. It would be much more efficient if, for example, the financial market or the bank would evaluate my project and would say, okay, you want to, um, you want, uh, to lend 100,000 euros. We, have, we think your project is okay, but we will only give you 50,000 euros because um, your project is not too promising. And in this situation, the bank is using its allocating function of saying, okay, we have 100,000 euros, but we have five projects and in your case, we are only giving you 20,000 euros and we are giving the remaining 80,000 euros to a more promising project. So the bank and the financial market have to allocate the capital. And they also have to select the participants that can get a loan and those participants who are not able to get a loan. So they have to restrict access to the market and this is also done by financial intermediaries. For example, uh, what happens? A financial market, a prime example of a financial market is stock exchange. Can you trade on stock exchange? No. You need to be registered as a trader with the stock exchange. So the stock exchange makes sure that you have the appropriate qualification to act as a stock trader. Okay, so the access to the financial market is restricted. A bank does the same thing, but we can all go to a bank, but the bank, if you want, for example, a loan, the bank will ask you uh, what income do you have, what is your project idea, and so on, and it will select those participants that can engage in this market, and it will also select those participants that have not uh, a good rating and that are likely to default, and these participants I excluded from this capital market. Okay. Now, these are very general functions of a financial market and also of a bank. But what makes banks special are the following three functions. The first one is the lot size transformation. Now, if I'm in need of 100,000 euros, my first idea would be to ask one of you do you want me to grant, uh, do you, can you grant me a loan of 100,000 euros? And you would immediately say, I do not have 100,000 euros lying around. So the lot sizes of, um, that I need and that you are willing to invest, they do not match. And the bank can alleviate this problem by accumulating small lots and small amounts of capital from depositors and giving out large loans. And this is usually what happens in a bank. Each and every one of us has a savings account, has uh, a deposit account, and we bring our small amounts of money and capital to the bank, but the bank is giving out larger loans. They're giving out millions, they're giving out large real estate and mortgage loans, and they do not grant loans, say, 5,000 or 10,000 euros. This is retail banking. Banks also do this, but usually loans are larger than the amounts each customer has on his or her savings and uh, deposit account. So this is the first function. The lot sizes are transformed. The second one is maturity transformation. Why maturity? Fristentransformation. 
if I go to a bank and if I open a savings account, I'm not interested in investing this money for a very long time. So the maturity of this uh, investment is very small and the maturity is very short. But if you go to a bank and buy, for example, a house and you need a mortgage loan, you are interested in lending money for, say, uh, 10 years, 20 years, even 30 years. So the maturities will not match. So if, for example, again, uh, I want to buy a house now, this time for 100,000 euros, and I ask you as um, investors directly, are you willing to give me the money? You might be able to tell me, okay, we are willing to give you 100,000 euros. But then I would say, okay, I need it for 20 years. And in this case, you would say, ah, no, 20 years, no way. I can only give you 100,000 euros for one year. And without the bank, without the financial intermediary, the contract will not um, come into place. We will not find a suitable contract that suits both, both our needs and interests. The bank, on the other hand, the bank will accumulate deposits and savings, and it can give out loans. Why? Because it gives out money, um, savings and uh, deposit accounts are terminated, but new customers arrive and new capital flows into the bank. So the bank usually has a capital stock uh, for giving out um, larger loans with a longer maturity. Okay. And last but not least, risk transformation. For example, if you go to a bank and open a checkings account, a savings account, you are interested in an almost risk-free investment. If you go to a Sparkasse, if you go to a savings and loan association, you are earning 0.1% interest or even 0%. This is risk-free and it should be risk-free. If the bank, however, is asked uh, to finance a mortgage loan, this is a risky business, this is a risky asset, and the risk of all the small deposits used to finance this large mortgage loan the risk of these two different types of investment, the risk will be different and the risk profiles will differ. So if you go around and try to finance this uh, loan directly from investors, if the lot sizes fit and if the maturities fit, it might simply end up with the investors telling you we are willing to invest 100,000 euros for 20 years but we are not willing to take up such a high risk so that you can take this money and use it to buy a house, for example. So again, in the direct interaction in the financial market, this contract might uh, not exist, but here the bank will help um, match these different risk profile, profiles of investors. This is what is done in banks. In addition to these, basic functions of banks. Bank, uh, banks also have a very important and play a very important role in the economy. And you can simply sum up this role of banks in an economy in the word lending. Lending, 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 lending. Banks lend money to companies and uh, to corporations and companies use up this capital to invest into assets, into new manufacturing plants and creating jobs. So this is the part where I usually um, get angry with uh, our socialist uh, party in Germany, because if you hear um, left-wing politicians, they will always uh, talk about, oh, bag, bags, uh, banks are all bad. You have to break up the banks. And if you, is every, anyone from the United States? No one? Okay. If you've uh, followed the, um, the presidential uh, election campaign, you might remember Bernie Sanders, we have to break up the big banks, you have to break up big banks in this way. And it's not as simple as that. Yes, banks can create a lot of harm and they can harm the economy in numerous ways, but they are also a vital part of a developed economy because they play such an important role in financing the investments of corporations and in creating jobs. 
And if you talk about um, the role of banks in an economy, the first role is to lend money to corporations, to companies. And corporations suddenly can invest this money and then create jobs. And by creating jobs, they are, of course, creating economic growth. Next, central banks and banks also create money. And we will learn about this in more detail later on, but you might uh, already know that um, the banks do not lend out and do not give out paper money, but they're giving out electronic money and what we call in German Buchgeld, book money, or Giralgeld. So money that is only imaginary, that is not uh, in, uh, given in paper notes, but which is only seen on accounts and uh, in, uh, in your electronic uh, accounts. Yes. But by doing so, the actual amount of money is enlarged by banks. Because if banks give out um, loans on their accounts, the total sum of money that is flowing around in the economy is enlarged. And by doing so, um, banks again play a vital role in the functioning of, uh, functioning of an economy. And last but not least, uh, companies uh, and banks are essential for the proper functioning of the payment system. If you take away the lending, if you take the, away the deposit taking, we still all need banks to say uh, pay our rent, to get our um, wages, uh, to pay our bills. So we need banks um, for our payment system. And this is why banks are so important for an economy. <laughs> this is essential for several reasons. First, it's absolute nonsense to talk about the abolitioning uh, and the abolition of banks as a whole. Uh, it might make sense for banks uh, to be small and to stay small. And it makes sense to break up banks that are too large and too big to fail. But it is total nonsense, especially for the, from left-wing politicians, to talk about banks as if they were all bad. Like banks only want to earn money and they want to screw you and uh, so on. You need banks in a developed economy um, for these reasons, especially for lending and for um, supporting economic growth. Without banks and without lending, uh, we wouldn't have this um, social welfare and uh, the economic welfare we have now. So this is the first reason. Um, the second thing about this, uh, why banks are so special in an economy is because they are so vital for corporations to finance their projects and because they are so vital for the payment system. This is why the state takes a particular interest in banks and why each state in every country says we cannot allow banks to default just as uh, freely as, for example, we would allow shoe companies to default. If a bank defaults, the payment system might be impaired, um, corporations might not be able to get a loan and suddenly economic growth is affected. And this is why banks play such a uh, special role in each economy. And this is why we have banking regulation. And this is why we have banking supervision. OK. OK, so the next part uh, will deal with the distinction between commercial banking and investment banking. To, take a, to make it very simple and to give you a hint what the next lecture will be about, Commercial banking, corporate banking, commercial banking is lending and deposit taking. So the banking business, a savings and loan association, a credit union does. This is commercial banking in what we talk about in the US as commercial banking. Everything else that is related to the financial market, to securities markets, this is investment banking. So buying and trading securities, that papier geschäft. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, um, giving out securities, 
um, bonds, etc. This is what is summed up in investment banking. Investment banking is much more risky, it's much more profitable, and um, in every country we have a special provision whether banks can do both. Then we have a universal banking system, like in Germany, for example, or we have uh, um, a system where investment banking and commercial banking are separated. That's what we call in German the Trennbankensystem. And we'll learn about that in the lecture next week. Do we have any questions? Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and see you next week.